before the actual reading starts. So if you need one more cookie, you could you could go get a cookie and listen to my introduction, and I wouldn't be offended. Um, <laughs> Because we have a lot of cookies. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> I'm Candace Black, director of the Good Thunder Reading Series. Thank you for braving the elements and joining us tonight for a reading by Jordan Devereaux, who is the winner of the 2018 Robert C. Wright Award and fiction writer Sequoia Nagamatsu. The series is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. The series also receives support from several departments and offices of Minnesota State Mankato, in particular, the Department of English, the College of Arts and Humanities, the Office of Institutional Diversity, and individual donors. I invite you to meet up with me and Carson at the, Carf the Coffee Hag tomorrow um, at 12 for um, what we're calling After Good Thunder. It's a very informal discussion about any of Sequoia's Good Thunder visits or events. Uh, we had copies of Sequoia's book, Where We Go When All We Were Is Gone. They are sold out, but we, yeah, great. But we are taking orders and um, that will get a signed copy to you. So um, you could talk to us at the table after the reading. And then also we're, we're still selling um, our lovely notebooks, blank notebooks. So if you're um, working on the next great American novel this is where you should start. Um, carry it around with you, write in it. Um, also tonight, we're celebrating um, the Robert C. Wright Award winners. And uh, I'm going to introduce the two finalists and, and then Jordan before he reads. But first, I want to say something about Robert C. Wright and the legacy he left for the Creative Writing Program. He was a professor in the Department of English here at MSU and served as chair of the department for many years. He was a strong supporter of creative writers and established The Corresponder, a periodical devoted to reviewing publications by Minnesota writers. An endowment was established in his memory that spotlights and encourages the creative work of MSU students. Additional support for second and third place prizes comes from an anonymous donor. There were 36 entries in 2018. The judge for the competition was Deborah Monroe, the author of two story collections, The Source of Trouble and A Wild Cold State. Two novels, Newfangled and Shambles, and two memoirs, On the Outskirts of Normal and My Unsentimental Education. She lives in Austin, Texas, and teaches in the MFA program at Texas State University. So I'm going to introduce the two finalists um, and ask them to stand while I read the words that Deborah Monroe said of their work. Leah Alsaker is in the back. You can turn around and make her. <laughs> Um, Deborah Monroe said this about her work. Uh, she, she went third place for her creative nonfiction and poetry submission. Leah Alsaker's essay, An Aesthetic for Suffering, is a beautifully written, beautifully imagined creative nonfiction piece. As it reminds us that chronic pain is a lifelong companion, it deepens our understanding of disease and resilience. She's a good poet as well, but the essay's unique perspective and beautiful language are exceptional. Congratulations, Leah. <laughs> Ashley Richardson <laughs> won second place 
<laughs> One second place with a fiction submission. Deborah Monroe said of her work, Ashley Richardson's short story, In Search of Africa, is a profound meditation on race that decontextualizes race, that decontextualizes race, makes race unrecognizable by conventionally American standards. Its prose is sharply chiseled and precise. Congratulations, Ashley. Um, so I will introduce Jordan, who will read his poetry, and then he will introduce Sequoia Nagamatsu. Um, but before I depart, um, I just want to um, remind you to fill out your, quest your survey. Turn it in on the little ledge back there. Um, it really helps us with the State Arts Board. Believe it. <laughs> Please believe me. Um, stop by and chat up our sales table. Have some cookies over there. And um, be sure to join us next month when um, our visiting writer will be poet Laylee Long Soldier for a four-day visit. So we're excited. So finally, first place winner, Jordan Devereaux. He is in his final year of the MFA program and has served fittingly as the editor of The Corresponder, as well as a poetry editor, operations editor, and managing editor of Blue Earth Review, Minnesota State University's literary journal. Of his poetry submission, Deborah Monroe said, Jordan Devereaux's poems start, as one of them says, with a fact, then move toward mystery or an unsolved act of charity and so depict a landscape any of us might recognize, but also locate it within another world. They remind us, as Paul Elward wrote, there is another world, but it, but it is in this one. Their subtle wit, moral seriousness, and understated but delicate language beguile me. Please welcome Jordan Devereaux. Hello, does that work? Yeah. All right. Good to see everyone. Lots of friends. I'm Jordan, as Candace said, and I'm going to read some poems. All right. Um, but first, I think I want to thank Carson, because Carson is amazing and Candace is amazing. They did a really good, good job with this. Um, and also Sequoia for coming out. It's really rad. Um, he's a really nice guy. And the Robert C. Wright endowment is awesome, and it has made this, easy, uh, this year easier financially for me, and uh, made this all possible. So thank you to all of those. All right, my first poem has got a long title, but I will just begin. What began as an exploration of motherhood ends up revealing the complicated relationship I have with my memory and senses. Or did hundreds of tiny spiders actually disperse from the smear of mother spider I smashed out of fear? According to my friend E, or was it D, an egg sac has to be perfectly ready to pop for the babies to emerge running like that. According to the internet, what I killed was a female wolf spider who had already birthed her spiderettes and happened to be carrying them all on her back their first days on Earth. I didn't know it then, but that image of me, probably five or six, surrounded by the green walls of a public restroom stall, watching legions of them scatter across the floor like eight-legged sparks from the bottom of, of my merciless size two, I didn't know that moment would come to occupy the space in my mind reserved for the instances in which I felt my pact with reality had been broken. Why multiply instead of die, I thought. Where was the justice in that? I remember another particular afternoon in which my cousins and I went to catch bugs on the shore of the Jordan River near my grandmother's house. I managed to trap in a mason jar a dozen or so randy grasshoppers who, 
On our walk back home, and despite sealing the lid on tight, nevertheless, I swear to you, materialized outside the glass and began swarming my hands and my arms and my shirt like I was some kind of biblical crop. It was manic, like one of those dreams you try to explain to a friend, how one thing led to another, but before you could understand how you got where you were and why, you were awake, feeling different, reborn. And um, I'm going to skip one that I was going to do for time's sake. Um, and this next one's an oldie. It's called uh, Existential Dentist Chair. Yeah, it's a classic. Um, <clears throat> all right. If I'd had taken care, she wouldn't be hovering over me, fucking my uvula with a latex finger and a plastic tube, inhaling the spit when it dams, her monocled eyelashes thick as bent nails. She shoved in a mouth guard wired with diodes to get a picture of my broken tooth and showed me the frayed nerve about to surface from my gums like something that should stay buried. The oblong bulbs of tulips, a childhood pet, crushes on second cousins. They'll have to scoop out the rot underneath the tooth, which will cost so much I'd be obliged to leave a tip. <laughs> it's that or lose the tooth. It's rare and therefore worth the money to find someone who will take such care for the sharpest part of the body. This dentist with her steel hook, brushing away the buildup of plaque as a paleontologist would, discovering the bones of an extinct animal covered in dust. Out of some ribs and a femur, she'd reconstruct a model to display on the second floor of the Natural History Museum of the future. Its placard would read, these omnivorous mammals ran and played. They invented bombs and cultivated flowers. They copulated with meaning and meaninglessness until they died. They were very good at dying. They had voracious appetites, too. Please do not touch. And this next one is a longy, um, but I hope a goodie. It's called uh, an, incom an Incomplete Synopsis. I could not keep my eyes open watching that movie about that important 19th century English painter and his unhealthy sexual habits and love for the sea. Though could anything be more universal? Maybe it's just me. Still, I kept floating in and out of the plot like curtain in a breeze. Earlier that day, I had written a poem about moving away from a place I'd grown to love. And to stave off the nostalgia that threatened to rock the poem to sleep, I flipped through a dictionary and my fingers landed on the word shoot. It lay sandwiched between the entries for shook and shooting star, meaning I was somewhere between fear and wishing, which is acceptance. And isn't that what they tell you to shoot for? The dictionary has that spectacular ability of keeping words at a distance. Regardless, I'm going to miss my second story apartment in the sunroom with the window, above which the same bird has returned each spring to nest in the crook between water spout and the white clabberds of a building formerly known, according to the lettering on the door, as Gerlick Manor. This time, my finger lands on billet doux, then crepe, antacid, eventually landscape. If you do this enough, you may arrive at a word that fits your purpose. The English painter fam famously returned to lodge at a cottage overlooking the ocean. It was there he set many of his landscapes at sunset, bloodying them with reds and yellows imported, or pillaged, probably, from some place that wasn't Britain. I just can't imagine anything as vibrant as the colors he used to depict his shipwrecks coming from a locale where clouds take their summer vacation, where the word humdrum was coined. Maybe it's just me. It's April 11th, and yesterday it snowed. Sorry. From my window, I can see the wall that separates the Minnesota River from the street, as if the two couldn't be trusted together. To compensate, the city contracted local artists to paint a mural of the river along the wall, 
making it a river on a wall that imagines the river before the wall. This time it's sensory, then ditch, bluegrass, and sediment, matter deposited by water or wind. The problem with these kinds of poems is that they may begin to drift, making them difficult to corral, like tempests, each one announcing itself as the last. I fell asleep before the English painter learned this elementary fact. You cannot trap the sea inside a frame any more than you can a robin in a window or a river in a box. The problem with inviting everything in is that nothing is revealed. In order to get an accurate picture of the host, you must triage the details and act the loss that is his defining feature. And these next two poems I'm going to read are um, from this exercise that I gave myself last winter. And it was really cold, and it seemed like it would never end. And I was super depressed about that, and I couldn't really write anything. And so I bought a sad light, and I was writing um, sonnets in front of this sad light. And I would try and write one in like under two hours, or at least a draft under two hours. Um, so naturally, I called them sad sonnets. And this one is, um, so I'll just read two of these. Um, and this one's a user's manual. So I guess it's kind of like the sad sonnet user's manual. And there's a, a line I took from Rilke. Um, but I mean, you can ask me which one it was later. I guess I can do a quote or something. Um, so this is sad sonnet user's manual. Don't let the frozen bones of the city keep you from feeling right. The light will let you finally live the seamless life proclaimed in your song. The graceful life of those who are more suited to the climate, like polar bears. Though perhaps now is not the time to think about the plight of polar bears or the plight of the climate. Not yet. If you're reading this, you haven't been here long. You must give the light some time to work. Mere minutes under its blue glow per day, and you will feel as though pursued by tigers with serotonin teeth. Don't be afraid. Don't listen to the poets who would have you suffer. Think of the light as a real incandescence. And those flowers you feel tickling the inside of your skull, ignore their plastic edges. Pick one and pin it to your shirt. And this sad, this one is, uh, this other sonnet is a uh, sad sonnet, truth or dare. I ate a green slug once when I was 12, and in doing so lowered my standard of living, <laughs> eventually growing to accept April lasts exactly 30 days, no more, no less. Speaking of sprouts, there is currently in my armpit an ingrowing hair, and in that way it is more of a root. It mostly doesn't smell like lavender. <laughs> that the two things most crucial to survival are water and air is a fact I find disconcerting. Shouldn't they taste a little better? What does that say about our prospects? I wasn't thinking about the future when I ate that bug. I wanted to be liked and wasn't, and in that way was no different than February, which is mostly ice and crows. And. This is my last one. Is that good? Are we on time? Yeah. All right. And this one's my last one. And it's got a leading title, a running title. It's where the first, the, the, the title is like grammatically the same or connected to the first line of the poem. Fairy flies are the smallest flying insects and are invisible to people, most people without a microscope. I find it's good to start a poem like this one does with a fact, then move toward mystery or an unsolved act of charity, like the bag of oranges we once discovered in the back seat of her car. It happened, we thought, while we waited inside my parents' house for the Volvo to emerge from the cocoon of ice it had grown overnight. It was Christmas morning, and so we guessed it was the next door neighbor, Jeff, who must have crept across the driveway opened the back door, and dropped in the gift of oranges like stolen gold. It was like one of those holiday commercials in which a good deed is done anonymously, but by the end, the viewer knows Coca-Cola or Chevron was behind the whole thing. <laughs> in the suburbs, these things can happen in real life. So you can imagine my frustration when, 
we found out it wasn't Jeff, but my mother. Or rather, it was we, my girlfriend and I, who forgot about them. The little bag of clementines among the long list of groceries my mother asked us to pick up a couple of days before, hidden yet not in the detritus of back seats. Embarrassed by the fact of our ordinary fruit, we then did what any true believers would. We threw out the torn, frosty peels and wiped the evidence from our chins. And that's it. Now the, the main event, the headliner, Sequoia Nagamatsu. Sequoia Nagamatsu is the author of the story collection, Where We Go When All We Were Is Gone, by Black Lawrence Press, silver medal winner of the 2016 Forward Reviews Indies Book of the Year Award. Originally from Hawaii in the San Francisco Bay Area, he was educated at Grinnell College and Southern Illinois University. He co-edits Psychopomp Magazine, an online quarterly dedicated to innovative prose, and teaches at St. Olaf College and the Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing. Kelly Luce says his universe is one in which modern Japan and its ancient folklore play in the same delightful puddle. Creepy, unnerving, and full of heart, these tales of love and demons, death and Godzilla, loss and possibility, will creep into our dreams and enchant your imagination. Please welcome Sequoia Nagamatsu. hear me? Good, All right. So thank you, Jordan, for that introduction. Thank you, Candace, and everybody that made my visit possible. Um, I'm just kind of glad that I was able to, to arrive here in one piece. I'm not really used to driving in any kind of winter weather or winter roads, but I suppose uh, I'm going to have to get used to that <laughs> at some point. So I think I'm you know, earning my merit badge for Minnesota um, during this visit as well. So I'm going to read a couple of pieces. The first is going to be an excerpt um, from uh, The Return to Monsterland from my first collection. And then I'm also going to read um, the entirety of, um, I forgot what I chose. I think The Pig Son, um, which is about a, um, a pig, a donor, an, organ, an organ donor pig um, that's been bred to you know, give hearts and livers and lungs to human beings. Um, but in creating this genetically engineered pig, um, he's developed telepathy and, and a higher intellect. So um, my agent thought, was, thought it was weird, and it's like, it's really weird and kind of ridiculous, but you made it work. So I kind of found that to be high praise. Um, I was kind of afraid of even telling anybody what that story was about, because I basically I would be saying, well, it's about a talking pig. But it's really more than that. It doesn't sound as stupid as it, as it you know, comes off to be. So all right, here's the return to Monsterland. Train car, 1998. Mayu called me from the train car that Godzilla had grabbed hold of. No screaming or sobbing, no confessions of great regrets, no final professions of love. She did not ask to speak to our five-year-old daughter, who was unknowingly watching the news coverage of her mother's impending death as the train crashed into the side of a skyscraper and through a set of power lines. My wife spoke of feeling the radiation of his body coursing through her own, the view down his Cretaceous mouth, an atomic breath swirling in a maelstrom of blue light. And then, before there was nothing but a roar and static, she said, you should be here. He's simply magnificent. Godzilla, irradiated Godzillasaurus. Description. Resembles Tyrannosaur with pronounced arms, dorsal plates similar to Stegosaur, semi sapient, powers, atomic breath, nuclear pulse, imperviousness to conventional weaponry, and meteor impacts. Regeneration, amphibiousness, 
telepathy with other kaiju. Weaknesses, high voltage oxygen destroyer weapons of mass destruction, anti-nuclear energy bacteria, cadmium missiles, and mecha Godzilla. Field notes, lumber waddle, posturing roar, rhythmic stomp with sun, perhaps a game, picks up palm tree and throws, swats seagull, defecates two meters high, radiation 15k rad, moves arms up and down, calisthenics or victory dance, long a roar, shuffles across beach, throws log into water, throws rock into water. Two weeks living among their kind on the island reserve we've created for them, and I still can't wrap my head around the love my wife felt for these creatures. During the atomic age, when nations illuminated the atolls dotting the Pacific, we gave birth to many of the kaiju, annihilation begetting annihilation, when the living ghosts of Hiroshima still roamed the streets. The Ministry of Defense contacted me partly out of kindness, I suspect. The widower of the famous monster biologists, the silent partner who stayed in the lab. I knew the creatures almost as well as Mayu did. The half-life of their blood, the frequency of their telepathic thoughts, the variations of their origins and resurrections. I could, without a doubt, answer Japan's questions of new monsters being born in the wake of Fukushima, of old monsters shaken out of armistice. And so I said yes because I hated their kind, because my daughter, now a college student, still reads the letters her mother left her, because I need to experience the beauty my wife saw before she died. Dear Ayu, I had to watch the video of your first steps from the bottom of the ocean. I wish I could have been there, but I guess all of her practice trying to walk paid off. Do you remember how we watched old news broadcasts of the epic kaiju battles of the 60s? I'd pick you up by the arms, your feet resting on mine, and we'd take one giant step after another, waddling across the living room. Whenever I let you go, there would be a moment where we both thought that you could make that first step on your own, but you flapped your arms like Rodan or Mothra, trying to maintain your balance before crashing to the ground. Your father tells me you're moving nonstop now with your newfound freedom, that you circle the house until you're so tired that you need a nap. I wish you were here with me. I hope these letters will help you understand why I was away so much. It's just me, a steel sphere, and two tiny windows right now. Miles of ocean are dead because of us. The oxygen destroyer killed a former Godzilla several decades ago, along with everything around him. Suffocation before the atoms of his body weakened, leaving nothing but bone. A shark hunts in vain, still. A jelly billows past like a cloud. I rake away layers of shells and fish husks from his skeleton with the submarine's robotic arm collect them piece by piece. Godzilla died then because we didn't understand, because we were always afraid. And despite him saving us from danger time and again, we never seemed to learn. Mu, sunken civilization, geologic curiosity, aquatic paradise, scuba dive excursion. Mu, home of the Nikal, shaken beneath the waves overnight, temples entombed in lava, megalith highways to the Mariana Trench, the Nikal, catamaran refugees, ancestors of Egypt and the Fertile Crescent, Manda, water dragon guardian, still defending the Nikal after millennia. At a college dive, Mayu and I discussed her dissertation on the kaiju as heritage. Creatures who came before us were created by us that served us. Creatures, I added, that no longer belonged. But we must find a way for them to belong, she insisted. Try reasoning with a three-story lizard, I said. Tell that to the parents of children who died when these children, when these creatures decided to throw down on their school. A piece of moo has been placed off the coast of the reserve for Manda to protect. A collection of pillars, the worn smirk, smirk of a standstone warrior, 3,000 pounds of drowned mountain, five miles of ocean surrounded by an electromagnetic field. This is what we can give them. This is where they belong. Mothra, moth goddess, moth goddess, current stage, larval. Description, segmented brown body, blue eyes, pronounced mandibles, powers, silken spray, several beam weapons, strong psychic communication, 
as an adult able to create gale force wind with wings. Lightning from antenna, effectively immortal, travels with fairy sisters, the Elias, three inch woman in red tunics. Field notes, undulates around island, tries to follow butterflies and moths, visits other kaiju, sways head with varan, chews on shrubs and grasses, draws mandala on beach with body, sends sonic pulse to manda. The Elias, Laura, and Maul ride its back. The Elias laugh frequently, whispers, song. A glorified grub, a far cry from the bright orange and yellow wings that Mayu and my daughter loved. Perhaps the most beloved of the kaiju because she is a goddess, because through her sprightly companions, we understand the moth's chirps, the roars and groans of other kaiju. Godzilla doesn't hate humans, but humans hate us, the little sister declared on national television. Fair enough, I say, but he still flattened my favorite, favorite soba shop in the country with several elderly ladies inside. Used Tokyo Tower like a toothpick. Maybe we shouldn't have used missiles. Maybe we could have spent time coming to an understanding but parlays are an afterthought when people are running out of their cars and screaming down the street. Mayu said that's typical human behavior, the kind of trait that would ruin humanity in the end. Shoot first, ask questions later. She reminded me it was the kaiju who saved us from alien invasions, the Kalakians, the Millennians. Ayu, who became quite the activist in her junior high class, following her mother's letters as text, would always say, Kaiju don't kill people, people kill people. And love is the greatest weapon of all. The Elias sisters pay me no mind most of the time, but occasionally flutter around my head, giggling like schoolgirls, providing me insight into each of the creatures. Godzilla is very sad today. Godzilla remembers your wife and is sorry. Godzilla cannot help being Godzilla. Manda is lonely. There were once many sea dragons in the sea. Manda knows Mu is far away. Mothra remembers when humans were not here. Mothra says those were peaceful times. Mothra says quiet will come again one day. Varga has indigestion from eating a strange plant. Gorosaurus wants to find love. Angurus wants to get to know you better, get to know Rodan better. Nobody really likes Kumanga. Kumanga is grumpy. Kumanga will try to kill you. Kumanga, irradiated arachnid. Description, brown, two stories tall, slender prehensile appendages, serrated legs. Powers, thick webbing, stinger, appendages used for impaling, cutting, and holding, jumping abilities. Field notes, mummifies wild boar in silk, repairs webbing between hillside, shoots silk spray at passing seagulls, circles territory of other kaiju. Kumanga senses the vibrations of my footsteps, follows me with bejeweled eyes. Unlike some of the other kaiju, Kumanga has not shown higher intelligence, a propensity for sacrifice and friendship. His world is one of binaries, moving versus non-moving, alive versus dead, light versus dark, cold versus hot. He straddles a ridge watching over a valley. He could jump, impaling me with one of his legs as he lands. He could shoot silk and draw me close to his fangs, injecting my body with digestive juices as he wraps me for a later meal. Through my binoculars can see the tiny hairs of his abdomen, the reflection of the valley several times over in his eyes, that there are several emergency hatches to the island's underground lab near Kumanga's territory is no coincidence. In the wild and in households, spiders keep insect populations low. Their venom, sometimes deadly and painful, can be engineered to treat pain, relax muscles. But Kumanga's venom is uranium rich. His insects are humans and large animals. His appetite too savage for a tiny blue world. Kumanga raises his body, spreads his front limbs wide, revealing his reach. I open a hatch as his limbs coil in for a jump. Beneath ground, I hear the pitter-patter of his legs, the chittering of his mandibles. A three by three titanium square and 20 meters of soil and rock separates us. And I can't help but remember news footage of the pounding of children in the school bus turned on its side as Kumanga approached. The seismic readings Mayu took of his legs wrapping on the ground, calling for a mate the nuclear age failed to provide. And you still think they belong, 
I asked Mayu. Do we belong anymore? The destruction they cause, the destruction we cause, don't you see beauty in them? There are many beautiful things in nature that are best kept hidden. Dear Ayu, I hope your first year at university has been going well. I'm very proud of you. When your mother was alive, you wanted to follow her to the ends of the earth. You have her letters and her phone calls and the handful of memories of days you spent together. This is who the woman I called my wife was to you. She's the woman who chased monsters, protected them from the ugliness of humanity. She was other things, certainly, to me, to those she worked with, to people in our family. You remember us getting into fights and me being the bad guy sometimes. You stood perfectly still as I cried onto your tiny shoulders, squeezing you tightly after static was all that remained of my last conversation with a woman who I loved and hated and respected. Her last words, you should be here, he's simply magnificent. And I think I'm coming close to being able, being able to see what she saw, but I need your help. I need you because you're the best parts of her, the parts that flourished in the imaginings of your memory and the wonder of people who watched her television shows and read her books. Enclosed are tickets and travel arrangements for your school break. In many ways, this will be your return to Monsterland. As you've been here in your dreams, in your drawings, and the models you've built where the kaiju live happily with Barbies and Totoro. There is no question the kaiju will get loose again. You kaiju will be born by design and accident. They will defend us and they will attack us and they'll die only to be reborn eventually returning to the haven we've created for them. You can run tests, observe their behavior to forecast the probabilities of these things. But I'd like to believe that your mother is here too, that she's become part of this cycle. We haven't always seen eye to eye, but I need you to help me pass the primeval roars and stomps, the image of a train car hanging from claws. I need help seeing the beauty of a radioactive glow within an embryo that can breathe life into the ancient, transform the ordinary into the incredible, and to make chaos somehow make sense. So that was the return to Monsterland. <clears throat> okay. So we're moving on to Godzilla to pigs. And because uh, I feel like my wife says I'm really good at titles, and, and um, sometimes I feel like the title kind of just comes to me, and it's such a good title that I need to kind of write a story around it. Um, with Where You Go When All We Were Is Gone, which is, I mean, I still love that title, uh, but it, it's, a, it's very long, there's a lot of W's, and so I'm kind of in this phase of like short titles, and so right now it's just called Pig Son. Um, it's not terribly imaginative, but it is what it is right now, and I kind of like the fact that it is so short. So, short. so here's Pig Son. After my ex-wife and I buried our son, I committed myself wholeheartedly to my lab, growing hearts and other organs inside of pigs that could have saved Peter. <clears throat> it's his birthday today, which means Laura texts me more than usual, which is pretty much never. Do you remember how he fell asleep hugging books? I've forgotten what he smells like. I ran into some of his old friends at the grocery. They're all so tall now. I never respond. Laura doesn't want a conversation. That would be too real. In the same way, I've never included Peter's failed transplant in peer-reviewed articles or presentations. His file sits to my desk instead of our program records, a lost statistic. My graduate assistant, Patrice, is telling me to come out quickly but there's also another voice out there, muffled and nasally and not just a little bit frantic, that I don't recognize, repeating the word doctor as if they are trying to convey entire thoughts with one word. When I open my office door, I see my staff gathered around one of the glass holding pens where we keep our organ donor pigs. Nicknamed Snotorious P.I.G., after an undergrad intern <coughs> put a gold chain and shades on him during a Halloween party, donor number 28 studies me as I approach wiggles his behind and barely opens his mouth. Doctor. Okay, very funny, I say, turning to my staff. Who is it? They look at each other and Patrice points back to the pen. We really think it's notorious, she says. Okay, sure, 
forget the fact that these pigs lack the necessary vocal cords for human speech, even with their genetic modification. Doctar. This time, the pig's mouth doesn't move at all. I'm starting to get annoyed, but there's also something to the voice I can't quite put my finger on. Again, I say. I hop over into the pen, nearly sliding on a piece of shit, and kneel, looking into the pig's blue eyes. Say it, Doctar, he says. Jesus. The pig's strange voice, like Steve Buscemi doing a Don Corleone impression, reverberates in my mind. And after several more tests, there is no mistaking it. The pig's brain, not quite human, not quite swine, lights up like a firecracker on the EEG and MRI whenever he speaks. This does not leave the building. Not yet, I say. We need to know what we have here, and we don't want someone else taking him away. The staff nods, but that simply isn't good enough this time. I need, you to hear, I need to hear you say yes, I won't say a word. Yes, I won't say a word, they all say in unison, like it's still grade school. OK, good. But this isn't some top secret facility. There are no security clearances and repercussions. The undergrads, especially, are suspect even on a normal day, swiping test tubes and pipettes for god knows what. It's only a matter of time. We divide the day between working with Snortorius and fulfilling hospital organ orders, and I pay Patrice's sister, Ami, a speech therapist, to assist. A room is cleared out as a study play area where we put a TV and computer equipped with pre-programmed paddle buttons, specifically modified for pig feet, and I dig through my attic for my son's old books and toys. Doctar. It's no surprise the word he heard the most around the lab would be his first. When Ami and I work with him, he seems to soak up everything we share. Flashcards, cartoons, children's books, including the three little pigs and Charlotte's web. We're treating him like a child, but it's hard to say where his mind is at any given point. Ami gives him treats, gold stars. Positive reinforcement is important, she says. He's learning so fast. At first, he has favorite words of the day, something new he doesn't want to let go of. Sheep. Horse, farmer, bus, yellow, mud, ami. In the mornings and evenings, he screams the word hungry or makes a specific request from his rapidly growing vocabulary. Apple, he says one morning, please. The other day, he told Pat Patrice thank you after he finished eating. Good pig. He favors Animal Planet, snorting excitedly when he sees hippos, but also has a fascination with car shows like Top Gear. Not to 60, he says. Petrol, petrol, flappy, flappy, flappy paddle gearbox. Some teams he runs around the room, snorting to an imaginary finish line. But tonight, just as I'm about to leave the lab, I hear Snotorius say a new word, lonely. I approach his playroom and sit with him, scratching behind his ears. Lonely pig, he says. My phone buzzes. My ex again with a photo of Peter at Disneyland, just before he tried to shrimp for the first time and burst into hives. Snortorius repeats himself as he often does, and I can't help but feel guilty for giving him this life, a life that would have ended weeks ago had he remained silent. A heart to Indiana, a liver to Michigan, lungs to DC. Of course, we've made other arrangements, but something else tugs at me as he speaks. I think about how when I go home, I'll heat up a microwave dinner, flick through the TV without setting, settling on anything, and curl up in bed, watching the only video I have of Peter, a two-minute clip of him making a sandcastle over and over again until I fall asleep. Instead, I grab the sleeping bag I keep in my office for when I'm burning the midnight oil, a half-empty can of Pringles, and keeps notorious company. He rests his chin on my shoulder as I read to him, his snorts creating a damp crescent on my polo, where the wild things are first. He points a foot when he wants to me to linger on a picture, sometimes bringing his snout to the page as if he could hand, hand, inhale my words. Max, he says, wild rumpus. That's right, I say. He can't quite read yet, but Patrice and Ami are working with him on that. He's got his ABCs down, and I point to words as I read so he can put two and two together. When we switch books to the Velveteen Rabbit, so Notorious sticks his feet on my hand as I try to flip past the title page. He points to an orange stegosaurus nameplate pasted onto the back of the front cover with Peter's name scrawled out in black crayon. Peter, I say. I take out my phone and show him a few photos. I point to myself and then back to the pictures to drive home with the relationship. My son. 
but I don't know if Stintant Snortorius comprehends what I'm saying just yet, having been raised in this building since he was a piglet, never really having a mother save for a petri dish. Peter, he says, Peter's son. Peter used to yell at me from across the hall after he brushed his teeth, telling me it was story time. He'd always ask for one more fairy tale, just a few more pages, almost always falling asleep as soon as I picked up again. Snortorius is getting sleepy too. His eyes are fluttering. At home, on my nightstand, story time has been waiting for years. There's a bookmark just 40 pages shy of the end of The Lord of the Rings. Peter was already reading it on his own, but when he came, became hospital bound, we revived our tradition. When the nurses came that morning for his surgery, I almost wanted to tell them to hold on. Please, we have to finish. But the surgeons were waiting with the heart I had carefully engineered. I told Peter that the ending would have to wait his return. I wake up to a still empty lab, but I find a sticky note on my forehead that reads, prize swine, typical. When I slink back to my office, I have a box full of emails from friends in the department and beyond asking about Snotorious. Someone had leaked a video on social media. Posted last night, the video already has over thousands of views. Most of my colleagues outside of the lab no doubt think this is a joke but a couple have said they'll stop by anyway, most likely to take a selfie or something. My associate dean will also be paying a visit, but seems less amused by the attention. Outside, Patrice is shuffling about, setting up workstations for the day. Do you know anything about this video? I hold up my phone. I also want to ask her who wrote the note on my forehead, but that doesn't really matter now. I just saw it a few minutes ago. I'm already getting emails about it. Patrice is a good seed almost two by the book, unlike her older sister, who is the sort who spins flaming poi balls at Burning Man, judging by her Facebook profile that I admittedly stalk all too often. I know Patrice didn't do anything, but she's obviously nervous. She can't look me in the eye. Her, eyes, her hands are shaking as she puts supplies into drawers, and her large plastic glasses slide down her nose every time she bends down. I'm not accusing you, by the way. But if you have any idea who might have done this, I don't know. Maybe one of the interns, one of their girlfriends or boyfriends. I really didn't see anything. I grill others as they arrive, but I need to turn my attention back to Snortorius and run damage control. Hide him, but how to explain his absence? Can I somehow get him to shut up when my colleagues arrive? He's out I'd outside yelling, hungry, 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 hungry. Ami is already tending to him, rubbing her nose affectionately against his snout. Patrice, get in here. I need you to play interference. Let me know as soon as anybody shows up. What are you going to do? Get the diazepam. By the time anybody arrives, Snotorius is back in his normal pen, all but knocked out. Associate Dean Hayes barely spends time with pig number 28, probably concerned that something in the lab will stain his suit. He drags me to my office to lecture me about keeping a tighter rein on my staff. You're an asset to this university, he says. I focus on the carnation on his lapel. Who the hell is this guy? Don't turn the important work you do into a circus. Of course not, I say. I barely register the rest of what he says the moment I see Patrice waving her arms in the air in the background as my friend and colleague, Dr. Brett Gaffney, shows up with some of her students in tow. Brett's in her usual rainbow tie-dyed lab coat, leading her students like this is a san sanctioned field trip. They're snapping photos of Snortorius, laughing it up, taking group photos with one finger pushing their noses up in pig solidarity. One, two, three, oink. Brett says, holding up a selfie stick. I'm trying to distract Dean Hayes as he leaves, but he notices our vis visitors, the utter lack of professionalism, the disregard for the sanctity of the institution. What exactly is going on here, he asks. He turns to me. This is exactly the kind of thing I was talking about. Ami and Patrice are in the pen with Snortorius rubbing his back. He's still mostly out of it, but he seems to be aware of the commotion. They weren't invited, I explain. I promise I'll find out who took the video and have it taken down. Of course I want to do this, but I doubt it will happen. I'm willing to just say, to say just about anything to get everyone to leave. We really need to get back to work. Stanford Children's Hospital is waiting. Dean Hayes grunts, and he, he and the Gaffney crew are about to leave when Snotorius decides to speak. Noisy, he says. Noisy, noisy, sleep, sleep. They stop in their tracks, and Dean Hayes does an about face. It's obvious to our visitors that this voice is different, 
like a microscopic person caught up in the crevices of their minds, shouting to be heard. What was that? Dean Hayes asks. That voice. Ami, Ami, scratch ear. Holy crap, Dr. Gaffney says. Dean Hayes drags me back to my office. Over the coming days and weeks, several meetings are held. Half the departments on campus want a piece of Snortorius. Initially, Dean Hayes wanted to relocate him, and that still might happen. But we've since convinced him that Snortorius trusts us, especially after multiple failed attempts of other researchers trying to get him to speak without me or Ami present. We have added security, of course, a guard at the door, and access to the lab for only key personnel after hours. Today, neuroscience has their dedicated time. I'm sitting in the corner overseeing the session, feeling a little like I've just turned over my child to some Nazi scientist. Snortorius looks back at me frequently, letting out subdued melancholy squeals as the others place sensors all over his body. Doctor, doctor, I want to chase them off and hold him. Everything is going to be okay, I say. It's okay, it's okay, I'm right here. I I honest, but I honestly don't know if any of that is true. I don't know what others have planned for him. And that's not to say that none of us here aren't studying notorious, that I didn't see fame and money when I first heard him speak. But reading to him every night, getting to know him a little more every day has changed everything. He loves belly rubs and the back of his ear scratched. He prefers Star Trek to Star Wars. And when we took him outside to the little Japanese tea garden behind our building, after he asked about the sky, I couldn't help but feel joy over the wonder in his eyes as he looked up. All the tiny little things we take for granted that he's been deprived of. Fresh air, the feel of grass in our bare feet. Bird, he said. Bike, girl on bike. He looked down at his feet, his reflection in the pond, becoming aware of how different he was from the rest of us. Tree, many tree. The researchers bring in all kinds of equipment, but they need my permission to break skin in any way whatsoever. I always say no, not yet. There must be another way. But I keep waiting for the call where Dean Hayes or my chair tells me I have no other choice but to let people conduct research as they see fit. And where is the limit to that? Drilling into his head? Can someone turn him to pork chops just to see if Snortorius would taste the same? But as much as I hate all of this, we've learned more about why Snortorius decided to speak. The stem cells and genetic instructions that we use to grow human donor organs at, at accelerated rates had gone rogue, targeting the brain. Theoretically, this was always a possibility. Protesters outside my lab never let me forget it. But after hundreds of procedures over the years, I think most of us discounted the idea of a pig person, let alone one who could communicate telepathically. Two, Stratoris's brain is continuing to grow in size and complexity at an alarming rate. Most of the researchers are forced, focused on the possibility of what this means for cognitive ability, but Patrice helped Dr. Gaffney with projections. If Stratoris's brain doesn't stop growing, complications will arise. Headaches, fainting cells, seizures, and eventually death. How do you tell a child that he might die? When Patrice told me the news, I called my ex out of the blue for the first time in years. She didn't know anything about Snortorius, and I honestly didn't want to go there. Maybe she would have thought I was full of shit. No, I just wanted to talk to someone who loved Peter, who could remember the moment when the doctor told us our son probably wasn't going to make it. Do you regret not telling Peter how bad his condition was? I asked. He knew. How could he have not known on some level? but I think he appreciated not really knowing. We let him be a kid. I didn't really know what else to say. I was hoping Laura would pick up the conversation as usual and walk me down memory lane. David? Yeah. Are you okay? What is all this about? Nothing, I said, just thinking. But I could see Peter waving goodbye as the nurses rolled him away for surgery. I could see Snortorius asking me to help him as I stood in arm re arm's reach away. You are a doctor. He is doctor. Everybody doctor. Centaurus's speech abilities have improved dramatically over the last weeks. And we've reached a point where Patrice, Ami, and I think maybe it's time to have a serious talk with him. Our pig son, as Ami refers to him. I am a pig. What job is pig? He has begun placing people into categories, purposes, and asking the big questions like, why are we all here? 
why can't you talk to other pigs? He asks about love and friendship when watching soap operas. He asks about war and crime when watching the news. Kissing means love. Many bad people outside tonight. We can't just keep telling him, we'll answer him later, Ami tells me in my car in the parking lot. When we're near Notorious, we try to clear our minds as much as possible. We still don't know for sure how his telepathy works, if he can read our minds, or if he can only transmit that way. She squeezes my hand, and part of me thinks about the possibility of us, but everything has to be about our pig son now, in the same way that Laura and I had ceased to be husband and wife, and instead become partners in trying to help Peter, in trying to keep Peter tied to this world. I know, I say. I know you're just trying to protect him, but it's not like he's a boy. As much as we might wish it, he doesn't have the same rights in that lab as us. He's going to have even less freedom when the government gets involved. They're going to move him away from us, soon. It's just that, what is he going to do with what we tell him? Ami remains silent for a while and looks out the window. The crystal around her neck casts a tiny rainbow on the dash. We help him, she says. We give him options. At night, after the lab has cleared out, I let the guard know that I'll be working late and disconnect the security camera in Notorious's room. Story time, he says. Yes, soon, I say. But first, we need to talk to you about something. You asked me yesterday what is Pig's job. Notorious comes closer and sits in front of me. He's wearing a bright red cardigan Ami knitted for him. <laughs> now fully grown, he towers over my head when I sit on the floor I knew I would choke up, so I've come with a slideshow and videos and a tablet to help illustrate my points. You might have had a very different life, I begin. I show him a vegan activist video. I explain to him that old, Mac old McDonald's song he learned with Ami has another side to it, and that it wasn't just about animals living together with their human. So Victorious takes a moment to process this. Pig is food? Yes, sometimes, I say. But some people keep pigs as pets. And there are wild pigs, like the ones that you see on your nature shows. People eat pig? So the Snortorius' snorts become frantic, like he can't quite catch a breath. He is squealing now, the saddest squeal I probably will ever hear. But I'm afraid the guard will hear and check on us. Shh, shh. I embrace Notorious, rubbing his back ears. But that wasn't your job, OK? Here we go. I continue my slideshow, and I get to the diagram of the, of the anatomy of humans and pigs depicting our organs. Inside, I say, pointing to, to my heart, to his heart. I pull up the ultrasound cart and run the probe over my chest. See, thump, 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 thump. I tap my head, hand in tune to the beat. When I run the probe over Snortorius's, his ears automatically perk up. Heart makes us alive, he says, studying the next slide. Yes, that's right, the heart is very important. I pull my phone out and show him a photo of Peter. Son, Peter, he says. Son, Peter. Peter had a bad heart, I say. I tap Snotorius's normal heartbeat on the side, ba bump bum, ba bump bum, and then mimic arrhythmia, ba bump bum bum, ba bump bum bum, ba bump bum bum. Your heart is a human heart, a special heart. I advance the slide to recent transplant recipients and then to a diagram clearly depicting the process, a big yellow arrow from a pig's heart to a human body. Your job is to save people. Again, Snotorius takes time to process this information. He rolls on his side, his ears twitch. Pigs not save, Peter, he says. No, I say, but pigs have saved many other people. Pig die without heart. Yes, I say, pig die without heart. So Notorious lumbers across the room in deep thought and hits the paddle button for the TV. He flips through several stations before finally settling on the travel channel, a program depicting Machu Picchu. The snort sniffles start again. I never go this place, he says. He flips the channel again to two people kissing, an old episode of Dawson's Creek. I never do that. He's about to change the channel again, but I place my hand on his foot. You're special, I say. I almost tell him the whole truth, but, but the thing that makes you so special is also killing you, I say in my head, hoping he can hear me. What do you want, I ask. I want home, he says not here. I call Patrice and tell her and Ami to swing, the, swing, to swing by the lab, um, swing the lab's van to the surface entrance as soon as they can. 
Half the time, the rent -a cop is busy playing games on his phone or talking dirty on some 900 number. So there's a little, no, little to no chance of us getting caught, so long as we're back home by, by morning. Pig Express is here, Ami says, as she holds open the door. Where are we going? My house. Before I hop in the back with Ami and Senatorius, I swing by the driver's side door. Thank you for doing this. She's visibly shaken. Her hands are clutched tightly to the wheel. If we get caught, I'll tell the university that we forced you to do it. Don't worry. It's not a problem, she says. I can tell it totally is. Back in the van, Ami and I try to keep out of Snotorius's way. He's fixed to the back window, getting his first glimpse of the world outside of the campus, narrating things to us as we pass them. Blue car, truck, statue, tall building, lady running. So what's the plan, Ami asks, pushing Snotorius's prodigious behind out of the way. This isn't a jailbreak, I say. At least not yet. We need to think this through. Where would we take him? He doesn't exactly belong anywhere. Why take him out in the first place, then? I rub some Taurus's sides. His mouth is half open, his tongue dangling out in a goofy smile. He asked for home. I just wanted to give him that, if only for a night. We heard Snotorius into my bachelor pad duplex without trying to draw attention from the neighbors. But a group of college kids smoking a hookah in the back of a parked pickup truck spots us. Hey, hey, dude, cool pig, one of them shouts. So, this is where the magic happens, Laura says. I'm barely here, I say. I pick up trash and dirty laundry from the sofa and lay out a blanket for Snotorius near the gas fireplace. Fire, fire, Christmas fire. Christmas isn't for another month, but maybe we do have a present for you, I say. I search the house for Peter's old soccer ball that he never really got to use and kick it over to Snotorius. It's already past midnight. We only have six hours at best before we need to head back. What are we going to do? Patrice asks. She's huddled in the corner of the sofa, still a ball of nerves. Apart from getting a, you a drink, I slink to the kitchen and return with a bottle of scotch and three glasses. We bounce around a few ideas and settle on watching movies. Laura and Patrice choose Heather's. So Notorious chooses The Rock. Maybe we should get something to eat, Laura suggests. I look in the kitchen and heat up all the remaining TV dinners I have, three beef stroganoff, two veggie lasagnas, and then run to the 24-hour market for a cake and some candles. By the time I return, our weird little family is already half an hour, a half hour into Heather's. I can tell Snotorius is watching, but is preoccupied by the new environment, constantly looking around at photos on the wall, sniffing all manner of stains and spills on the rug. I curl up next to him and pull out a family photo album, keeping my mind wide open for him. Snotorius asks questions about every memory. Who, where, how old? I've never had someone so genuinely interested in my life before. Ocean, he says. My ex-wife and I went to Hawaii for our honeymoon. So big, he says. So blue. I try to visualize Laura and I scuba diving off Maui, hoping Snotorius can feel the water around him. Midway through the second film, we pause for cake. Patrice comes in with the candles already lit, and we sing happy birthday, even though Snotorius was released from his gestation pod in March instead of November. Make a wish, I say. And I wonder what goes through his mind, knowing whatever he wished for will never come true. Maybe he knows, too. Nicholas Cage is saving San Francisco from being nuked when I get an email from Dean Hayes. Effective later this week, Senatorius will be relinquished from our care and permanently transferred to a facility off campus under federal supervision. Ami and Patrice both beside me see the message. We share a look but remain silent behind Senatorius allowing him to enjoy the movie. I attempt to clear my mind of fear, muddling my thoughts with noise, the theme song to Growing Pains, an image of Peter singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer during a school play. Ami types out a message on her phone and holds it in front of me. What are we going to do now? We give him choices, I text back. When the film finishes, I turn the TV off. Patrice always already has tears in her eyes. Ami sits on the floor and rests her head on Snotorius. Sad friends, sick pig. Sad friends, pig go away. Yes, I say, pig knows. Snotorius snorts, shaking his head. If he knew about being taken away, about his growing brain, what else does he know? We want what's best for you, Ami says. We don't want you to go away. Patrice says, barely intelligible through her sobs, we'll find a way to keep you safe, I say. 
we'll find a way to make the rest of your life as happy as we can. The awkward silence and Patrice's sniffles are killing me. I turn the stereo on low for background noise, and I realize I need happier music. Some Taurus sways his head to Hootie and the Blowfishes only want to be with you. Pig sick, he says. Friends get trouble. We can take care of ourselves, I say. Don't worry about that. We go through two more songs before Snotorius speaks again. And at this point, we either have to return to the lab or make a break for it. Pig go back. Pig sick. Pig help people. I don't understand, Ami says. But Patrice begins bawling again. She knows that Snotorius is asking us to free him in the only way we really can. Pig heart help. No, 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 Ami says. Her voice breaks. You can stay with us, see more of the world, whatever time you have left. Pig go back, pig help people. Are you sure, I ask? Do you understand what you're asking us? So Notorious sits up and touches his snout to Ami's forehead before walking over to Patrice and doing the same. Picture. In the campus quad, we let Notorious watch the first glimmers of sunrise, orange, purple, yellow, pink. Ami watches us from afar while Patrice is already in the lab making the ne necessary calls to the hospitals in the tri-state area in need of organs. I sit with our pig son on the frosted grass. Beautiful, he says, shivering. I drape my jacket around him. It is, I say. Story time? Sure. What kind of story? Finish Peter's story, he answers. Centaurus turns his head and looks straight at me as if to say, I know about that too. I know more than I could ever tell you. And almost as a reflex, I gently pull him closer to me and kiss his forehead. Centaurus rests his head on my shoulder, and I do my best to tell him about the return of the King of Gondor. On our short walk to the lab, I tell him about the hobbits returning to the Shire. Home, I say, family, like you. And in the operating room, slowly fading from anesthesia, I tell him about Frodo's journey leaving Middle Earth with the elves before I place my hand on his heart, beating steadily for a boy 200 miles away, and tell him thank you. Thank you. <laughs>